um, a nice talk with Ulf Träger, who is here today to talk about space making and space shaping. Um, like I said, maps are a huge part of our reality today. We use maps a lot and they change the way we see the world and maybe they also change our perspective on a lot of other things. And so today we have a talk here um, and with Traeger, whom I'm welcoming very, very warm today. Um, he will, um, yeah, give you some more insights about what's possible and what we can do with maps. So give him a warm applause. Welcome, Ulf. Thank you for the announcement and the invitation. I will talk in German. There is a live translation in English. There will be a live translation into English. So please, if you um, need this, um, call this deck number or seek help at the end. I want to talk about maps. I want to talk about maps. I want to talk about digital maps in the next half hour. I will also explain that maps and their dig digitalization are getting more and more important for our worldview. And I want to show you some examples of the pre-digitalized age um, to show you that maps are not um, value neutral. They always have a, a worldview behind them and they are always have been created with a certain intention behind them. And I also want to show you how maps, uh, what an impression maps have on us today. I will show you three examples, how map technologies, digital map technologies uh, today have been developed, how further development will happen, um, what uh, the political meaning of this development I already said that cards are never value neutral, they always have a social and political um, background. And I want to explain a constructive uh, handling of this background, political background. I also want to show you alternative cards that have another viewpoint, another political viewpoint um, behind them. And I also want to show you that the, the view on the cards will also be... Oh. Ah. I will start with a very old card because it's interesting, the form, um, the, how it presents space. This is a card um, which are which was used for hundreds of years. This is called a wheel card because of the round form. The interesting thing about this card is this metaphysical information, um, feelings, myths, monsters, dragons, uh, next to rational uh, things like space, uh, rivers, and this connects these two things. And since this was a Chris Christian map, the, the, mid, the point in the middle is Jerusalem. And the exact position is not, not important, it's just an overview of the world. These cards existed for a long time, but at some point they lost their use. There was a, a much more demand of cards that are actually usable for navigation, like cards we have today. And one, one, the main pressure that for, for these cards to exist was uh, sea, um, traveling by boat because they want to have exact cards for exact navigation. And someone who did this successfully uh, was Mekator. He, he did a good projection um, of the world uh, ball uh, on, the, on, the, as on an area. Up to today is the main uh, map 
Uh, we visited it nowadays in the two maps. Uh, where later, like in the 70s, the 20th century, there was the first criticism on these maps and this type of maps, this projection of those maps. And this criticism was uh, this projection of these maps for navigation, it works. Uh, the uh, term of use is it's conformal. You can start somewhere and you get up in your end where you want to be. It works for fine. But it is completely wrong if you look at the land itself. If you have an extra explanation, for example, in North and South, the land are way too big, but around the equator, where it's here in the middle, you can see it, I'll show it here, especially in the South continents, it's just the lands are too small. You see that very well at Greenland, if you look at top, it's about the same size as Africa, but in fact, it's just about one twelfth as big as Africa, and the criticism was you just get used to this, you think it's true, but in fact it is wrong, because uh, the equilibrialism is not true, and it favors this wrong image you get, because it's an European image of the world we have, and here in Europe it's very uh, we have a very small country compared to other ones, and so in this grotesque uh, uh, bigger thing, and we take this into account and accept this wrong image of reality. This led not to the fact that we have new maps, because the navigation was the main point and this works, but it opened the space we have to understand there are other maps. So maps are never neutral and mistakes in, the, in maps are often based on idealism and they're accepted on this space. Another important point in the history of maps is a conference held in 1884. It was held in New York. It's called the International Meridian Conference. This conference is very important because meanwhile there were very important tools for navigation, especially on sea, but still there was still a lot of confusement in the coordination system and especially in time zones. Every bigger uh, unit had their own coordination system, such as Denmark had uh, a ruling about, uh, about Altena, the town of Hamburg, and they had their own coordination system and they had their own time system. So if you take a train through North uh, America, you had like 35 local times, so every time you get out of the train, you had to orientate yourself in this new time zone and you had to ask people, what is the local time now? So to get rid of this confusion and to get a solution for this, there was this conference, we wanted to find a solution to unify everything. So, for example, transport of people gets easier. So the most important imperium, the great UK, you know, everyone here knows zero million goes through OK, it goes to Greenwich, uh, suburb of London, which also time for synchronization of, of uh, time. And what you see is that there are all these different aspects of time are just get together and space and area was uh, taken into one uh, whole thing. And we wanted to have a global system of coordinates, which was very important for the further development. And one example, one example which shows how important this is this standard rising, was not a conference. It's, uh, it was held shortly after. It was held a conference in Berlin. It's called the Congo Conference, 1884 to 1885. It was a very long conference, taking over four months. There were many rich people sitting together and discussing. Uh, the, the, uh, like countries such as uh, Germany or UK or Spain were sitting there and they were discussing all these issues, uh, especially about Africa. You can see it here on a map, how you can deal with it. The point was, there are parts of Africa which are from a Western point of view are not colonized yet. They're not known yet, so we haven't done anything about it. And basically, they wanted to see how they can split it among them. But this only works if you can define territory. You have to have the maps and the standards that everyone is talking about the same thing. So we have to take into account all the interests, we can take all the boundaries, um, also talking about uh, military 
was defending which point. So it was a very interesting point and it was uh, uh, close to the Meridian Conference. And this example shows that how these maps are also important for colonialism, that we can defend the, the areas we've already gathered and that can show their interests. So the colonialism was, of course, a, a, a So these maps were also important for the power of the cities. Another example, which Corona Coalition does not really uh, is set, but which is also an uh, important aspect, uh, it's a aerial photography. Which was important for uh, aerial uh, um, making pictures out of planes, <laughs> because it, it simplifies cartography immensely. Man, one was able to fly over an area and then uh, photographically um, categorize, categorize it. And this is uh, much easier than sending people on ground and measuring distances. So you can just make picture, uh, uh, area pictures out of planes and then at home measure the distances on the pictures. And so that means that our maps became a lot more precise. So this was made in the First World War, 2000, uh, 1916. The First World War. Uh, in the First World War, the, the um, uh, plane photography was, uh, everybody used it. But after the First World War, everybody um, uh, did the measurements on the maps and then uh, this, this information went through society and everybody was able to access the more precise maps. And so one example is this, an architect in the 20th century. Um, he used the uh, area of photograph uh, photography. Um, so this... He, he used the, the aerial uh, photographs to, to look at urban structures, to look at cities. And, and he used it to, to form structures and uh, city planning uh, from an aesthetic point of view. So he, he used the aerial photograph, uh, photography uh, to, to make aesthetic city planning. And of course, it was after war it's criticized that somebody does this uh, structuring from above, not taking into account the view of the individual living in the city. What is also uh, uh, some other uh, areas that phot aerial photography um, had influences on was um, somebody used uh, area photography to, to show social problems in cities. He showed that typical structures of poor uh, areas in cities, you can see from uh, aerial photography because, for example, the buildings are very close together. And um, his, uh, his, uh, his results were discussed because he used the uh, objective ca uh, cartography to get results of, about poverty and oh, sorry. Uh, many scientists criticized this type. Uh, for example, uh, there are some people who said aerial photography is just a surveillance. It's, uh, so. Um, uh, they refuse to accept this because the, the perspective on the ground, the perspective from the individuals living in the cities is way more important than this point of view from on top. And also other people uh, having a very huge debate and discussing this new technology and discussing where it's going. What mustn't be forgot, we always have to uh, recall, these maps were very detailed, very sharp, and the pictures, of course, they were. But still, 
it's still a representation, it's just a representation of the reality. And they're just get more complex and technology more advanced, so they seem to be more natural, but still it's just representation. And this point is something that gets shaped. So one example you all know uh, from the global positioning system, GPS in the 80s, I think it's what, 89, 90, something like that. It was uh, also open for private usage. So there's also a Russian system today. The European Union is working on our system. But this form of a global positioning system brought one new fact in cartography. The automatic, relatively precisely uh, representation of your own position on a map. And this made possible what you know, automatically. I already said it, it's a navigation system which lets you through the city, which tells you exactly your own position in the city. There are happening other things due to this global positioning system, GPS, and through this forms of this navigation system. First of all, the map changes. Maps used to be a big picture of a orientation system. Even though you only knew it for navigation from A to B, you always had the context. So you could read the map, you could collect all the information on your way, so you could see the whole picture. This has changed. The focus is much more narrow, it's much smaller. We only see navigation screen, we don't see the context anymore. We don't read it anymore, we just read, the, uh, look at the map somehow. We get additional information if you want to or not. So they're moderated from someone else, someone else has put them together, we don't have to take account, uh, take care of this. And that's the one very, very important change in this navigation form. Of course, the perspective is also something which changed. You don't have this pr like perspective from on top or the bottom, but now you have this ego shooter perspective. When you are on the ground, when you walk on the ground, and another important point, which in this uh, is shown here, it used to be f that maps were always being made prior. So the usage of the map was always afterwards the uh, generation of the map. But now using the GPS system, when you're mobile, in your navigation system, they're always recording. Sometimes you don't want to have this, sometimes you don't want to. For example, through software or surveillance, whatever. But whatever you do, wherever you go, it's recorded. So the creation and the usage of the map is happening at the exact same moment. So you can't take this apart. So the maps are always modified during my movement. And there are new levels of information. Because I move through the space or the area. So that's a very interesting point. Because there are different points of view, uh, how we can use this, the area around us. But your knowledge about how a person moves through the space, how is, he or she is using the map, is very uh, happening at the same moment as you're creating the map. And this brings me to the next point. When you look into the future, or when you look at the moment, what, what's happening right now? What is interesting at the moment? Which makes cartography which makes him changing, which will give it more other powerful uh, tools. So we can use in uh, politics, in social uh, points, or in cultural areas. I would like to show three aspects. The first aspect is satellite uh, photography, which is kind of uh, uh, something similar as aerial photography. So we go into a new, uh, new, new. Satellite photography in the public space, 1994, 1995, some people know this better than But in the moment, there are about 100, 120 satellites produced, and most of them are deployed or they will be deployed next year. They are very small. They're as small as a refrigerator, and they're produced by small companies. But they will they will improve the quality of the pictures drastically. So this, for example, is a satellite picture uh, from 2012, which has a very good resolution. Uh, it doesn't have the top-down perspective, it has a, a slightly asymmetric uh, view. 
and of course the second thing is the the mass the raw uh, uh, number of of satellites uh, you will get a lot more pictures so at the moment it is uh, normal that uh, uh, a random place in, in in the world will be visited every few days um, and soon we will have the situation that every single uh, location in the world will be visited like uh, every day up to 10 times and uh, so of course this is also trouble troubling because uh, of uh, surveillance aspects and uh, also, of, of, um, it's interesting of every commercial uh, usage of uh, maps. Uh, the second thing is, and there's not a lot of information about this, like in uh, other parts of digitalization, you can build algorithms that uh, replace humans. And in this case, it's, it's about, well, machine learning, self-learning algorithms that uh, learn to cartography and for example, this uh, nice picture was produced in February 2016 by Facebook and they announced that they use such a mechanism. Um, they want to use the, the uh, population density uh, and they want to measure it worldwide and they use satellites for that. So it's not very sophisticated technology. Uh, this technology just... you. Um, uh, uses the photography photographs by uh, of satellites to count buildings and then estimates how many uh, uh, how many humans live in every bu uh, building so it's not very sophisticated but this is already troubling that you can do something like this and the photography on the one side but um, this other uh, example I will show now is real-time data flows that are um, produced all the time and together with, with photography, you can do a lot of data analysis. So, for example, this real-time data flow is uh, um, from traffic, uh, traffic data flows. So industry has a strong interest in this, being active in this, collecting the data, and uh, uh, do something with data. So, one one is auto, the auto industry, the car industry. There is also un other interests, uh, platform economics, Uber, uh, also the state has interest in this. So in, in different, uh, on different levels there are different, um, different companies and interest groups collect this data. So for example this is uh, city data. This is very concrete. This is a, a project from Hamburg, this smart city project. This is a screenshot from the uh, supervision um, monitor in uh, uh, Ham uh, Hamburg Harbor. Uh, this shows how the uh, um, trucks are uh, supervised in real time and are, uh, um, and it shows how the trucks are. Uh, going through the city in real time. And this shows how something we... how every day... how something we know from every day can be represented as data. And this, this massive use of digital technology and cartography uh, can help you to to keep alive uh, uh, systems that already exist and to improve them. So another uh, important point, if you look at the uh, cartography and uh, machine learning and and big data in city uh, space, there will be different kinds of maps. Uh, it has been ages as uh, government has made the maps, but now it's changing for private operators uh, such as uh, Alphabet or smaller companies as Uber. They're using higher precise maps and they're also taking into account the movement, movement meta which is in these maps and what's happening 
there are maps as we can look at them as users or as drivers, but we don't see what Uber sees. So there are more classes of cartography. So this is a screenshot uh, how Uber sees the maps. So in the command center uh, in San Francisco, this information is written down here in this map as a normal people person you can't see this map and that's something which is going to be happening more and more that there are different filters of maps and what you see in the city the access to the maps and the second aspect and i have to hurry up a little bit the second very important effect which is happening is what you can see in this example it's a our, our cultural hype such as pokemon go as trees, factors, satellite photography, algorithms, and, and uh, map construction, and the third one, the big data flow. If they come together, people get a complete new geography from the city. They are led through the city. For example, you see here uh, one of these Pokemon Go meetings in San Francisco, Freshman's Frogs, where completely new ways and new patterns of movement in a city occurred because from this melange of these three factors. There was a general overview of these tendencies. Maybe in Q&A we can discuss a little later or after the talk. I just wanted to show some ideas and was just as important was I always said in the beginning. So next to these functional maps, for example, for navigation, it's as important that you make cards which show different views on the world, a different point of view from the city. So I think it's very important that those maps are opening a new space and show what's possible. So they give you a new point of view, what we in the space uh, is more than the structure. So one example that's a little bit older, I really like it. It's uh, from a, an institute from 2001. It's a Flash application. And it shows a very nice tool, that's New York. You see these red squares, there are Swain's cameras. And the tool allows you to set your one position and the destination you want to go. And it shows you the way you have to go, that you have the least cameras on your way. So it's a very nice example for a tactical tool. Of course, it also has a message. So this Institute for Applied Autonomy have made uh, similar things. That's, they said it's a tool we've made, but also it's a criticism on this uh, society of, of, of surveillance, and we want, to, we want to show how you can access room, for example. Another example, we are more into storytelling, which is also important or is that as important? It's not a project from the US, it's called Anti-Eviction Mapping Project. It's out of Francisco. In San Francisco, we have a problem. For over 30 pro uh, years, you have a gentrification. So the people we are been living there are made to move there and new peoples are coming. And this project has uh, the task, they want to document this process of gentrification. For example, how people have to leave their flats and what they do not only look at numbers, uh, which I display in maps, but they also want to give information from the people we have been living there. So this map is kind of a tool to get access to the stories, to the stories of these people. It's not as an archive as a museum, it's just a, a living construct somehow. And so you can really see what's happening there and that you have to be active because there's always a human being which is a victim of this. This one is an example from this project, um, how this map is projected into the uh, city. And it's a last project I want to show you. It's from Munich. I already showed you at the Congo conference about colonialism. Germany was also part of colonialism, was very active in this part. So in all the bigger cities in Germany, you have traces of colonialism, and in most of them, 
you have also people who are documenting this tracing, not only from historical reason, but more of we want to have to talk about to discuss this. And the nice thing about this project over here, they took a real map with real coordinates. But the thing we usually know, like streets and uh, other systems, you know, they took the systems. Uh, they took th their information and put their information in there and their information and the shape of their storytelling is made through this. I think it's a very important uh, project because it completely breaks off the image you have from maps. And as a last point, I have 30 things left. I want to show you some other things. So digital uh, ma uh, cartography is uh, very important. It's very easy to use. The technologies are very easy to use. And just to say something, there is open street map with, with open data. So you can make uh, cards, maps. There is also software, free software which helps you doing so. So GQI systems. It makes sense to make your own maps and maybe to get rid of these classical car maps and draw your own base layers. And as I showed in these three, these three images, there are very different aspects you can take into this. So you can take the whole context of these maps and show the social relevance. Very important, if there are no open geodata, please collect them and share it. OpenStreetMap is one of these projects. I want. It's a very good basement for this uh, map data. And this also has the aim to... to uh, so, it, so that we can influence the maps and we are not only influenced by the maps, we have to think about the future narrative of the maps. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Ulf. That was awesome. Are there any questions about this topic? We have a little bit of time, one or two questions we can answer if somebody wants to ask something. Hello, thank you for the lecture. I have a few comments. Um, cards at the same time producing car at the same time producing cards and using cards uh, he does not think that this um, so already in the seventh century um, okay it was just a comment not a question do we have a question Okay, this is it. There will not be no more questions. We don't have time. Thank you.